Welcome back everyone to ME 170. This is part two for lecture 13. In part one, we introduced the frequency response methods. In other words, when we take a control system and we feed it a harmonic input, that is a sinusoidal input with a certain frequency and a certain amplitude, we show that the output, output is going to be a harmonic function as well with the same frequency as the input but with two changed things. One is the amplitude of the sinusoid and two, the peaks and the throts happen at different times. That is the output signal is shifted phase wise with respect to the input. In order to see the change of amplitude and the change of phase between output and input, we've developed the concept of body plots. So for each frequency of our input signal, we will have a different variation in terms of amplitude and in terms of phase shift. Now we've seen a particular example which is one input frequency and we said well if we repeat the same um, concept, if we repeat the same calculations for a different frequency, we can find the uh, entire plots. However, that is quite inconvenient. So instead of doing that, we can learn how to sketch the body plots for a generic transfer function. Now, a generic transfer function for a system can be written in the following form. Now, this might look a little bit intimidating, but if we take a look at it more carefully, we'll see that there's nothing really scary about it. So this transfer function g of s will have a constant gain k. So every time that you have a transfer function, you should separate it like so. This is a sort of a canonical form for a transfer function once we want to find its body plot. So gather the constant gain and then we have all the product of real zeros. So notice that this is not usually the way that we've been writing the zeros. Usually we've been writing the zeros as S plus, for instance, sigma. But here for the body plot, it's really better to divide everything or actually gather the sigma so that we'll get one plus sigma to the power of minus one s. So that is the only thing that changes, but these two representations are equivalent in fact. All right, then we have poles that are not real, but they are complex conjugate. And so you can write them down as a second degree polynomial. Once again, this is equivalent of writing S squared plus two zeta omega n S plus omega n squared. What we've done we've taken omega n squared and retained just one plus two zeta over omega n times s plus s over omega n all squared. And so this omega n squared that you take out of this parentheses will just be part of your constant gain k. Then we have poles or zeros at the origin, depending on the value of n. If n is positive, then it means that we have poles at the origin. If n was negative, a negative number, it means that we would have zeros at the origin. But anyway, this just factor here 
indicates either zeros or poles at the origin. Then moving on, we have these factors here that indicate real poles. So once again, we would have S plus sigma, well, let's call it sigma P. And so you just do the following. There we go. So these, these taus are nothing but the sigma P to the minus one and sigma to the minus one. Finally, we have complex conjugate poles. Same thing that, so equivalent things can be said for the complex conjugate poles that I've talked about for the complex conjugate zeros. So pairs of complex conjugate zeros and poles are associated with a certain damping ratio and natural frequency. So these are the damping ratio and natural frequency for the complex conjugate zeros. And these are the damping ratios and natural frequencies for the complex conjugate poles. Anyway, we can only have four kinds of things. Constant gain, poles or zeros at the origin, real zeros or poles, and complex conjugate zeros or poles. In fact, we'll see that real zeros and real poles will be treated in almost the same way. The body plots for, for them will just be flipped. And same thing for the complex conjugate zeros or poles. The body plots will be equivalent, just slightly flipped. Since we're dealing with linear systems, sorry here, there you go. Since we're dealing with linear system, the principle of superposition applies. That is, we can draw the body plot for these single factors. For instance, we can start by drawing the body plots for the constant gain, and then we can superimpose the body plots for the other factors, that is, for instance, for the poles or zeros at the origin. And then we can superimpose the contribution due to the real poles or zeros. And then finally, we can superimpose the contribution of the complex poles or the complex and or the complex zeros. But once again, you only need to learn these four elementary simple body plots and then all you have to do is just to sum them up. So it's more of a question of drawing. Uh, the, the real difficulty here is just to sum things up, which is not really difficult once you practice a little bit. Now, in part one, we saw that S is really a purely imaginary number. So you have to remember to substitute s equals i omega in your transfer function. So once you've transformed your transfer function in the canonical form, then you're ready to uh, substitute s with i omega. Moreover, the tau to the minus one and all the omega n are called the breaking or critical or cutoff frequencies of the system. Now this is breaking and not break in, as in the breaking point in the root locus. So just pay attention to this. So sometimes I will be calling them breaking frequencies or critical frequencies or cutoff frequencies. They're all the same. So for tau to the minus one, is a cutoff frequency for real poles or real zeros, and omega n is the cutoff or critical frequency for a pair of complex conjugate zeros or poles. Let's start with the simplest uh, of the four 
elements, that is the constant gain. So let's say that our transfer function is simply a constant, k. So since we have two body plots, one associated with the magnitude and one with the phase of the transfer function, why don't we calculate both magnitude and phase of k? Well, this is quite easy. The magnitude is 20 logarithm of the magnitude of g of i omega. What is the magnitude of g i omega? That's the magnitude of k. k can be positive or negative in this case. So you have to always take the absolute value. So overall, the body plot associated with the constant function, constant gain is equal to 20 logarithm of absolute value of k. And so it's going to be a constant straight horizontal line at the value 20 logarithm of absolute value of k. So for all values of the input frequency, the magnitude associated with the constant is constant. So it does not depend on the input frequency. What about the phase of such transfer function? Well, here we have to compute the phase associated with k. So that is arctangent of imaginary part, well, k is a real number, so its imaginary part is zero, over k itself, which is the real part. Now, what is the answer here? If you were just to put zero over k in your calculator and calculate the arctangent, it will always give you zero degrees. But this is not always the right answer because if k is positive, well, that's good because let's say it's like having a positive real number. So the angle associated with the positive real number is zero. But if k were to be negative, then the phase associated with it is 180 degrees. So in this case, we will be between the second and the third quarter. And so you, have, you want to add 180 degrees. So it doesn't matter wh whether k is positive or negative, the phase is always constant though. So it's going to be equal to either zero if k is positive or 180 if k is negative. Now, sometimes we will see that the body plot prefers, or especially MATLAB prefers to, to draw the phases or the phase angles between minus 360 and zero. So perhaps the contribution phase-wise of a constant that is negative, instead of being plus 180, it will be considered minus 180. But minus 180 is equal to plus 180 degrees. It is the same angle. So just keep that in mind. All right, now let's consider the second factor, poles or zeros at the origin. So now I'm going to do the following. I'm going to describe the poles to, on the left and the zeros on the right. And uh, as a matter of fact, I will just describe the pole and then everything will be reverted for the zero, as you will see. Let's start by computing the magnitude of this transfer function that is simply one over s. So we just have, let's say, one pole at the origin. As usual, we need to substitute s equals i omega. So the transfer function is indeed 1 over i omega. What is the magnitude of this transfer function? Well, we have 20 log logarithm in base 10 of the absolute value of 1 over i omega. 
Magnitude of one is simply one. Magnitude of I omega is omega. Now we don't need to keep the absolute values because omega is always positive. Now we can rewrite due to the properties of logarithms, one over omega as one to the power of minus one. And we can take this minus one and multiply it outside the logarithm. So that's why we are left with minus 20 logarithm of omega. And so you see that in the log scale, this function is actually a, a straight line. It is a straight line though, but the value changes with the value of omega. This is how this line looks like. It's just a straight constant line with negative slope which crosses the zero decibel line at one radians per second. Why at one radian per second? If you substitute one into omega, logarithm of one is zero. So 20 times zero is just zero. So the line will intersect the zero decibel axis at one radians per second. Then as I said, this is a straight line with a constant negative slope. The slope in this case is of minus 20 decibels per decade. It means that if we start, for instance, at one, and we go to the following decade, that is times 10, so at 10 radians per second, the value of the body plot is going to be minus 20 decibels. And if we went even more to the right, let's say to 100 radians per second, so two decades after one radian per second, we would drop by 40 decibels. So we would be at minus 40 decibels. You can see the parallel to the right with the zero. So it's really the same line, but instead of having a negative slope, we have a positive slope of plus 20 decibels per decade. Now let's analyze the phase. Well, the angle associated with one over I omega is, well, the angle associated with one is just zero. And then we have minus, because we are at the denominator, minus arctangent of imaginary part, which is omega, over real part, that is zero. So we have a positive number divided by zero. The angle is 90 degrees. With the minus in front of it, we have minus 90 degrees. And this is, does not depend on the frequency. You see that there's no omega here. So it's going to be a drop, a constant drop of minus 90 degrees all over the spectrum of the frequencies. So this line is just a straight constant line equals to minus 90 degrees. You can notice the parallel with the, if we had a zero at the origin, well, that will contribute with the positive 90 degrees of phase. So poles at the origin, each pole at the origin will decrease the phase by 90 degrees, and each zero at the origin will increase the phase by 90 degrees. What if you had two poles at the origin instead of one? Well, the only thing that you would need to do is to increase the slope of this curve. So it will always pass through one, but now the slope would be minus 40 decibels per decade. And again, this is going to be with two poles 
at the origin. What about the phase? Well, we would have minus 90 times the, the multiplicity of the poles at the origin. So if we had two, well, that would become minus 180. And again, if you had three, then you would have a slope of minus 60 and the contribution phase-wise of minus 270 degrees. But it's like you're superimposing the contribution of each pole. So you're already applying the superposition principle. All right, let's complicate things a little bit. Not too, not too bad though. Here, I'll try to go quite fast though, because um, I don't want to get lost here in, in the maths. Uh, I just want you to focus on the plot, the, the body plot. So here we're talking about real poles or zeros. So once again, let's analyze the transfer function with just one pole. And uh, the transfer function having one zero will be equivalent, but just flipped. So here we're going to have our magnitude of this transfer function, which is minus 10 logarithm of 1 plus omega squared times tau squared. So this, this is definitely a function of omega. So we're going to have a the magnitude plot will change as omega changes, as the input frequency change. Instead of calculating each point, let's just calculate some extreme points. So when omega tends to zero, then we have that this function is equal to zero. And then when the function when, sorry, when omega is exactly equal to the cutoff frequency, that is tau to the minus one, the value of the function is exactly equal to minus three decibels. That is minus 10 logarithm of two, which is minus three decibels. What about when the input frequency is much greater than the cutoff frequency? Well, in this case, the function is going to be equal to minus 20 logarithm of omega, which is exactly the same function that we saw for the pole at the origin. So we're going to have something that start at zero, then at the cutoff frequency, we'll go to minus three, and then eventually we'll start decreasing with the constant negative slope. Let's go and take a look before looking at the phase, how this body plot will look like. Well, every time you have a real pole or a real zero, it is convenient to first draw the asymptotic plot. And in this case, the asymptotic plot is the dashed line and then draw the actual plot. So the asymptotic plot is pretty straightforward to draw. So all you need to do is you start at zero because for the frequency that tends to zero, the value of the function would tend to zero. And then you maintain it equal to zero all the way up to the cutoff frequency, which is tau to the minus one or one over tau. And then you start with the, a constant line with a constant uh, negative slope of minus 20 decibels per decade, like this. So this is going to be the asymptotic plot. Now, one, once you want to draw the actual plot, you can just shadow this asymptotic one and just making sure that when you hit the cutoff frequency you are at minus three decibels or at least three decibels below the the zero line and then you can just draw a smooth line that will asymptotically reach the dashed one so the only thing to remember is to maintain this minus three decibels, which is the main difference between the actual and the asymptotic plot. Equivalent thing can be said for the real zero. We still have 
a line that starts at zero and it's zero all the way to the catalog frequency. And then we start going upwards now with the constant slope of plus 20 decibels per decade. And remember that right at the cutoff frequency, we have that the difference between the actual plot and the asymptotic plot is three decibels. Now let's take a look at the phase. So the phase here for one real pole is going to be equal to minus r tangent of tau omega. So it's going to be a function that changes as omega changes. As we did for the magnitude, let's also compute its extreme values for starting for omega that tends to zero, then the phase, the phase difference between output and input will be zero. Now at a cutoff frequency, it's going to be equal to exactly minus 45. And, and as the frequency tends to infinity, so for very large frequencies, the phase difference will go all the way to minus 90 degrees. So what, once again here, we have two kinds of plots that we can draw. We can start with the asymptotic one. And so we start at zero and we maintain it equal to zero all the way to, now not the cutoff frequency anymore, but we're gonna stop at one decade before the cutoff frequency. So one decade before the cutoff frequency means that you have to take the cutoff frequency and divide the value by 10 or multiplying by 0 0.1. Then what you do is we are at zero, you draw a line with a constant negative slope that is exactly or will intersect minus 45 in correspondence to the cutoff frequency. Then you continue until you hit 90 minus 90 degrees, and that is at one decade after the cutoff frequency, that is 10 over tau. And then you will maintain it equal to minus 90 degrees. So you have these three segments from zero uh, to one decade before the cutoff frequency, the phase is equal to zero. And then from one decade after the cutoff frequency all the way to infinity, it's going to be equal to minus 90. And in between, it will change from zero to minus 90 linearly making sure that it is exactly equal to minus 45 degrees at the cutoff frequency. This is the asymptotic plot. So what are you gonna do with the actual or real plot? Well, then you just make it a little bit smoother. So it doesn't look like segments, but more like a smooth curve. Just making sure that you pass through minus 45 degrees at the cutoff frequency. You can see that for a real zero, everything is flipped. We go from zero degrees to plus 90 degrees, passing through plus 45 in correspondence to the cutoff frequency. We're almost done. We just need to see the fourth uh, term. And that is the complex conjugate poles or zeros. Now I'm just going to take a look at the complex conjugate pair of poles. And then for the zero is going to be flipped once again with respect to the real axis. All right, so here I'll just skip a few things, but these, these are the details for the magnitude of the transfer function. What, what we're going to do, we're going to take a look at the extreme values as we did for the transfer function associated with real poles. So for very low frequencies, we have that the magnitude tends or is equal to zero. Then in correspondence to the natural frequency or the cutoff frequency, we have a specific value 
of minus 20 logarithm of two zeta. And you see that this will depend on the damping ratio. So for different damping ratios, we're gonna have a different value in correspondence to the cutoff frequency for complex conjugate poles. You see here in red, I also included the equivalent for the zero. So here for the zeros, instead of having minus, we have plus. Once again, everything is flipped with respect to the real axis, or sorry, the zero axis. For frequencies that are much greater than the cutoff frequency, then we have a constant line, which almost looks like what we had for the real pole, but notice that now we have minus 40 logarithm of omega. So we're gonna have a line whose slope is constant, but now equal to minus 40 decibels per decade. Let's take a look at what the magnitude plot look like. All right, so you see here that we have different curves and that is because we have different values for zeta. So you can always start from the asymptotic plot though. So the asymptotic plot is sort of the same reasoning that we use for the real pole. We start at zero and we keep it equal to zero all the way to the cutoff frequency or the natural frequency. At that point, you start drawing a line with constant negative slope of minus 40 decibels per decade. This is the asymptotic plot. Now for the actual plot, the actual plot uh, can look like these curves here. So they can look quite different. And you'll see that some of them will have peaks and others won't have any peaks. So how do we know if we have a peak or not, just to, to be sure how to draw properly? Well, the peak occurs only if the damping ratio is less than square root of two over two. Square root of two over two is about Point seven zero seven. So if you have a an underdamped system with a damping, or at least if the damping ratio associated with a pair of complex conjugate poles is less than 0 0.707, then you're going to have a peak in your magnitude body plot. And the lower the damping ratio, the higher the value of the peak. And also the point, the frequency at which the peak occurs changes. So how do you know what the peak is and at which value it occurs? Well, you have here two formulas. So first, I'll give you the value of the frequency at which the peak occur. And this is called the resonant frequency. So it is equal to the natural frequency times square root of one minus two zeta squared. So you see that if zeta is greater than square root of two over two, we would have a negative number under the square root. Therefore, we wouldn't have a real number for the frequency itself. So what is the value of the peak? The value of the peak is given by this formula here, one over two, zeta times square root of one minus zeta squared. Of course, if you want it in decibels, you'll have to take 20 logarithm of this. So add it here also 20 logarithm of this peak here. Notice that if we had zeta equals zero, then the resonant frequency will be equal to the natural frequency, but the peak would go to infinity. So the peak will, will go all the way to infinity. 
All right, now let's take a look at the phase. Well, before doing that, just keep in mind that if we were talking about complex conjugate zeros, these plots will be flipped. So you'll have lines that come from zero have a peak and then will shoot up at a positive 40 decibels per decade slope. All right, what about the phase? So the phase is also a function of both omega and zeta. So we'll have different plots depending on your damping ratio. However, we have nice set values for when omega tends to zero, for when omega is equal to the natural frequency, and for when omega tends to infinity. That is zero minus 90 degrees and minus 80 degrees. Let's take a look at what the body plot looks like. First of all, let's draw the asymptotic one. So we start at zero, and then we go all the way this time to the cutoff frequency. We just go down vertically and we pretty much instantaneously change to from zero to minus 180. This is the asymptotic plot. So it's like a, a step, a downwards step for a pair of complex conjugate poles. Obviously, if we, if we had a comp pair of complex conjugate zeros, the step would be upwards from zero to plus 180. All right, once we have the asymptotic plot, then you're gonna have different curves for different values of the damping ratio. If the damping ratio is quite small, almost zero, then you will be very, very close to the uh, asymptotic curve. However, if zeta increases, then you will be more far away, for instance, right here. So how do you know which one is which? Well, here, if, you're just, if you just want to sketch the body plot, uh, this is not really important. You can take a look at uh, these sketches or these plots in the book. In fact, this is figure 8.10 on page 531, and uh, you can use that, or otherwise you can just sketch the way you want. The important thing is that the switch here happens at the corresponding to the natural frequency. And at the value, no matter the value of your damping ratio, the phase at omega equals omega n, that is at the natural frequency, the phase shift is equal to minus 90 degrees, always, because all these curves pass through this point here. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention is that it's always uh, a good habit to, to draw the two body plot, one on top of the other, so you can you can see at the same time both the amplitude change and the phase change for the same value of the input frequency. For instance, if we were to look at the frequency equal to the natural frequency of these um, complex conjugate poles, let's say that we were on the very last curve, then you would read this value, so a negative value in decibels, and then you will go down and read, well, here it doesn't really matter because at omega equals omega n, we would be at exactly minus 90 degrees. So always draw them one over the other. I will provide you for the exam uh, charts, so empty plots, so one for the amplitude 
for magnitude and the other one for the phase with the same x-axis so you can you can see both the amplitude and the phase at the same time for a particular value of the frequency. Now I want to stop here for today because of uh, time but next or tomorrow we're gonna uh, take a look at an example but please already try and uh, and look it for yourself and see whether or not you understand it. I include it in the PDF and tomorrow we'll go over that. Okay, this is all for today, and I'll see you very, very soon. Take care.